Well, hello and welcome. Good evening and welcome everyone to this live telephone town hall meeting. We can see that we already have some folks joining us on the line right now. Thank you so much for being here early. We are going to get started in just a few moments here, so please stay on the line as we continue connecting to more and more of your neighbors in the 7th District of New Jersey. Again, hello everyone and welcome. We are inviting you to join Congressman Tom Malinowski for this very special live telephone town hall meeting. Now this call is an opportunity for residents to ask questions, participate in polls, and hear updates on the latest from Congress. So with that being said, we want to know what you're thinking. Now if you have any questions now or at any time throughout this call, please go ahead and press zero on the keypad on your phone. Again, that's pressing zero on your phone keypad to submit your questions tonight. Also, we're always trying to expand our email list, so if you would please go ahead and press seven as well to provide us with that email, you will be able to receive the latest from the representative's office. Now, if you're interested in more information after tonight's call, you feel free to visit malinowski.house. Gov. Now, for those of you who may be just joining us on the line right now, we want to say hello to you and good evening. Welcome to this live telephone town hall meeting where we're inviting you and your neighbors in the 7th District of New Jersey to join Congressman Tom Malinowski in just a moment. He's here tonight to answer many of your questions. Malinowski served as a senior director on President Clinton's National Security Council, where he worked to end conflicts around the globe. He then served as the chief advocate for Human Rights Watch, where he led the bipartisan campaign to the end to, use, to end the use of torture by the Bush administration. Later, he served the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and labor, where he helped lead America's fight for human rights around the world. And we're certainly happy to have him here on the line with us tonight. And throughout this call, we hope that you ask him a question. So you can do so at any time by pressing zero on your phone keypad. An operator is going to grab a clear summary of what you'd like to ask the congressman and submit that for you tonight. So again, if you would like to ask Congressman Malinowski a question tonight, please press zero. Now, if you'd like me to read your question over the air, just let your operator know, and I will be more than happy to do so. Another reminder here before we get started to press 7 at any time as well if you would like to provide us with your email address for future updates. Or you can visit malinowski.house.gov forward slash contact forward slash newsletter dash subscribe. So in doing so here, we will be sure to keep you updated electronically moving forward. So one more time, that's zero to get your question in line and seven to register for those future email updates. Again, to get more information after the call tonight, be sure to visit malinowski.house.gov. Now, without further ado, I would love to get this call officially started off by turning it right over to your Congressman, Tom Malinowski, who happily serves the 7th Congressional District of New Jersey. Representative, please take it away. Thanks so much, and thanks, everybody, for joining um, for our latest uh, telephone town hall meeting. As you know, we do these in multiple formats uh, as often as I can. Uh, I've done well over 100 town halls open to the public to ask me uh, whatever questions uh, you all have uh, since I was elected uh, in 2018, and we're going to keep on doing them. Uh, there are a few issues that I wanted to touch on right up front before we uh, get get to your questions, and these are issues that I get asked about all the time, especially in the last uh, several days uh, and weeks. Uh, and I'll start with some modestly good news. I've, I've heard a lot of concern from constituents, uh, particularly since the horrific shooting of children in Uvalde, Texas, uh, about uh, what Congress is prepared to do, if anything, after decades of inaction on gun violence in our country. And uh, we have been um, discussing this on a bipartisan basis in the House and the Senate for the last couple of weeks, and, and we are getting closer to what I think is a decent compromise that will take uh, us forward, uh, strengthening the, uh, uh, the, the violent history check system uh, for people purchasing 
weapons in our country, particularly for uh, for uh, folks between the ages of 18, 21, so that we know more about uh, their juvenile history before uh, they're allowed to purchase a weapon. That might have made a difference in the Uvalde uh, uh, tragedy. Um, uh, banning or greater restrictions on what are known as straw sales of, of weapons, where uh, somebody who's not allowed to purchase a, a weapon uses somebody who is to purchase a lot of, uh, of guns. Often this is how criminal gangs uh, get their uh, weapons. Uh, we're going to get good, strong bipartisan agreement to crack down on that. Um, and finally, I hope, uh, although negotiations are still continuing, strengthening the background check system so that uh, unmarried uh, partners who uh, are convicted of stalking or abusing uh, their unmarried partner are uh, prohibited from purchasing a weapon in the background check system. It's ridiculous that that rule applies to somebody who is married to the partner they've abused, but not someone who is not. Uh, and uh, that so-called boyfriend loophole is something that I hope we will close. And on top of that, strong agreement for a significant increase in funding for mental health in our country, particularly targeting youth. Um, so that's good news. I, I wish I had uh, similarly good news to report uh, on another issue that, that I know is troubling to a lot of uh, my constituents, and, and that's the impending, looks like impending, Supreme Court decision repealing the Roe versus Wade decision that has been uh, the settled law of the land we thought in our country for the last uh, 50 years. And of course, it's not just a, a Supreme Court uh, decision, uh, but uh, the laws that will uh, immediately be passed or uh, come into effect in uh, states across the country, almost half the states in America uh, will ban abortion uh, in some cases at the point of conception, in some cases, even when the life of the mother is at stake. Um, Congress absolutely needs to act, in my opinion, to enshrine the protections of Roe versus Wade as the law of the land for this country once and for all. We can no longer rely on the Supreme Court to do what the vast majority of the American people want us to do, which is not to turn back the clock 50 years, not to start treating women and their doctors as criminals again in our country. Um, so Congress is going to have to do it. And right now we do not yet have a consensus, particularly in the United States Senate, where we would need 60 votes to break the filibuster. But I will continue to fight for that. And then finally, most important, I wanted to share some thoughts about what's happening in the economy. Uh, two years ago, uh, the economy it was dead in America. We had tens of millions of Americans unemployed. Virtually every business in the state of New Jersey, apart from the essential ones, was shut down. And the major economists in our country were on the phone with us in Congress saying, if you don't do something big and fast, we're not going to get those businesses back. We're not going to get those jobs back. But we acted. We did something very big, very fast, uncharacteristically for Congress. And the result is that the economy is back. We have the lowest unemployment rate in our country. Uh, in over 50 years. Um, people are spending money again. Uh, our state and municipal governments are solvent, and we are about to get in the state of New Jersey uh, a significant uh, uh, property tax relief uh, for everybody in our state, uh, every homeowner and every renter making under $150,000. Uh, and that is possible in part because Congress, uh, in a very hard-fought piece of legislation, uh, provided assistance to our state and local governments during the pandemic. That's the good news. The bad news, obviously, is inflation. That is uh, hurting every single one of us, particularly folks who struggle to make ends meet. Um, gas prices are $5 a gallon, as I don't need to tell anybody on this call, and that is painful and unacceptable, and we have to do something uh, about it. So, I want to focus on two pieces of this. Number one, gas and fuel prices, which are now about 30% of inflation. That affects food prices as well. Um, and what has happened uh, in the car market, which has been also up to about 30% of inflation. And that is due almost entirely to a shortage of microchips. So let me take the fuel, uh, the gas issue first. Um, first of all, important to know 
that domestic oil production in the United States, which went way down during the pandemic, is now back to pre-pandemic levels. In fact, average monthly production of oil in America has been higher, slightly higher under the Biden administration than during the four years of the Trump administration. But as you all know, we also made a decision to ban the importation of Russian oil. And we urged our European allies to ban Russian oil as well. Russia, the number two global producer of oil. It was absolutely the right decision as we try to stand by the people of Ukraine in defense of their country. Um, but obviously, we knew when we made that decision that it would have a significant impact on gas prices. But the war in Ukraine doesn't explain all of the problem. Uh, the global price of oil right now uh, is about the same as it was in March. It has not gone up since March. And yet the price of gas has gone up since March from about $4 to $5 a gallon. The difference is almost entirely accounted for by record profit margins uh, for uh, refiners of gasoline uh, in, uh, in our country. Uh, their profit margins have tripled just in this year alone. They've never been as high as they are today. So there's something going on here that is that can't just be explained by the pandemic, can't just be explained by the war in Ukraine. So here's what I think we should do. Number one, I don't think that ordinary middle-class American consumers should pay the entire price of the war in Ukraine. I think these companies that are making so much money should bear their share of the burden. So I'm in favor of a temporary windfall profit tax on the oil uh, uh, companies that are making such record profits, return that money to American consumers. Uh, number two, I've urged President Biden to use the Defense Production Act uh, to get uh, our refinery capacity back up to where it needs to be so that the oil that's being produced can actually be refined into gasoline. Uh, and then finally, I've urged the president to be much tougher than he has been so far on countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which are the only countries in the world that can literally turn up the dial and significantly increase the global supply of oil. And they have been holding back to try to leverage the United States to try to get concessions from us on other issues. Um, the president is traveling to Saudi Arabia uh, soon. I hope that will produce results that we will feel at the gas pump, and I'm going to hold him accountable for that. So that's gas and oil. Um, microchips, which, as I mentioned, explains uh, the huge increase in new and used car prices and increase in the price of just about everything that uh, depends on, uh, on this basic technology. Um, the problem is that we used to make microchips in the United States, about 35 percent of the world's microchips were made here at home. Today, we make almost none of the world's advanced microchips. So we are uh, vulnerable to disruptions in global supply chains, uh, whether due to a pandemic or conflict around the world. Um, this is true of a lot of other critical technologies, battery technology, pharmaceutical ingredients, PPE, you name it. Um, so I've been leading an effort in the House uh, to try to bring manufacturing of these critical goods and technologies back to the United States by creating uh, a new supply chain resiliency program at our Commerce Department backed by billions of dollars in loans and loan guarantees to help manufacturers bring, uh, bring these jobs back to America and these supply chains closer to American consumers so that we do not have to face these kinds of disruptions in the future. I think it's time things that are critical to our economic security, it's time that we make it in America again. Um, we have a bill that's passed the House, a similar bill that's passed the Senate, so I'm confident that at the end of the day we're going to be able to get something for President Biden and uh, get it into law. Um, so I, I, will, I will end it uh, there. I will just close with a comment that um, as difficult as these economic challenges are, there are solutions. I expect to be held accountable for uh, the solutions that I am proposing, that I am pursuing. I hope that you hold everybody else in our, uh, in our rambunctious political debates this year uh, to the very same standard. Sometimes I feel uh, when I look at some of my colleagues in the Congress that there are some who'd 
rather have the problem than the solution because the problem is something that they can run on in an election. I, I prefer to run on solutions. I prefer to run on reaching across the aisle, finding people who will work with me, doing something, even if it's not perfect, to make things better for New Jersey and for the American people. Um, and I hope that's something we can talk about in greater detail in our discussion today. Thanks again. Look forward to your questions. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. And now if you joined us a little late here on the line, we are inviting you and uh, many of your neighbors in the 7th District of New Jersey to join Congressman Tom Melanowski for this live telephone town hall meeting. And we're just about to get to Q&A here, so if you have a question that you would like to submit to an operator, please press zero. You can also press 7 to receive important information moving forward via email. So that's 0 to submit a question tonight and 7 for those email updates. Now I'd like to go ahead and welcome our first caller of our forum. We have Karen in Washington Township. Karen, you're live on the line with us. Go ahead with your question, please. Good evening, Senator. Um, obviously, I'm as upset with the price of gas rising as everyone else is, and it's really painful um, having to take that kind of money out of our um, savings accounts to be able to commute on a daily basis. Uh, my question is, why aren't we um, having more luck with trying to get more of the American oil um, produced in this country rather than look overseas? Thank you so much for the question. And, and, and again, uh, I, I, I totally agree. This is painful. It is. Um, it, it's it's not something that we can tolerate for uh, for very much longer. Um, so, as as I'm sure you know, oil is a global commodity. Um, so the price of gas, which normally is determined by the price of oil, uh, can be affected by events anywhere in the world. Um, we produce more oil in the United States today than we consume than we use. Um, so that sounds great. It sounds like we shouldn't have a problem, but we still have a problem because our oil companies, whether they're drilling in Alaska or Texas or North Dakota or all the way in Saudi Arabia, they are going to sell to the highest bidder, wherever that bidder is. It could be in Asia, it could be in Europe, it could be in South America, it could be right here at home. And so when we lose, uh, and we've lost about 3 million barrels a day, of Russian oil from the global markets, all those people who are buying that Russian oil are now bidding up the price of the oil we drill in the United States. And Chevron and Exxon will sell at the highest price they can get, wherever they can get that price. So even though we are producing more oil than we use, even though we're producing as much oil today in America as we were in early 2019, three years ago, um, the price has skyrocketed, partly because we've just lost so much of that Russian oil from the global markets. As I tried to um, argue in my opening statement, I, I think there is something else potentially going on. Um, I do think that some of these oil companies, and particularly the refiners that, that refine the oil into gas for our cars, are taking advantage of the situation because as high as the price of oil is globally, it hasn't actually gone up um, in the last three months. It's about the same today as it was in March, and yet the price of gas we're all paying has gone from about four bucks to five bucks a gallon. Um, and meanwhile, the profit margins of these companies have skyrocketed. As I said, the profit margins for our refiners three times today, three times what they were at the beginning of the year. So what can we do about it? Absolutely, we've got to increase production everywhere, and we've been, we've been pushing the companies in the U.S. to use their existing oil leases that the government gave them to drill more oil on those leases. As I said, I've been pushing Biden to get tougher on Saudi Arabia to drill more, um, because in the short run, we need more from them too. Um, but at the same time, I think we, we've got to ask some tough questions of uh, of these companies that are jacking up their profits. And if necessary, I think the president should use his powers under the Defense Production Act um, to ensure that our refineries are operating at full capacity 
so that as more oil comes out to the market, the price of the refined gas also goes down for all of us. I hope that uh, I hope that makes sense. Well, appreciate that, Congressman, and thank you so much, Karen, for joining the conversation here tonight. Let's go ahead and get to our next caller here. We have Cynthia in Phillipsburg. Cynthia, you're live with us on the line. Go ahead, please, with your question. Hi, good evening, Senate, um, Congressman and everyone else. Um, just to change gears a little bit, my question has to do with student loan forgiveness. There are some programs currently that assist people in certain fields of work, um, i.e. teachers, um, if they work for like a nonprofit or something like that. But there's a ton of people like myself who don't fall into that category and the debt does not seem to be going down. Um, the interest rates are, you know, are high. I have several loans. I had 10. I've managed to pay down three and that, and, and got out of school back in 2008. Um, what if anything is being done, what can be done? Are, are we working on anything that assists people like myself? Yeah, can I ask what 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 is the highest interest rate you're paying right now? Six point eight. Six point eight. Yeah, yeah. So that's out. That's outrageous. That's the part that I think we need to attack. Um, there's there's hardly anyone else paying six point eight percent interest for loans in America, right? Nobody pays that for their mortgages. Um, small businesses can get loans for a heck of a lot less than six point eight percent and it makes absolutely no sense it is a, it is a travesty that students trying to get an education which benefits not just you as a student but the the whole country that you will contribute to with that education are paying interest rates that high um, there are a lot of ideas out there um, some people want to just wipe out the student debt forgive it all I'm not in favor of that um, I am in favor of Congress acting to reform student loan uh, interest rates. Congress has a lot of power to do that. Um, we should be passing legislation uh, that would enable you to refinance that 6.8% uh, loan at a much lower rate. Um, and I also think that we should uh, pass a law that caps uh, repayment as a percentage of income. So, uh, you know, if you're making a, a ton of money, then you can probably afford to repay those loans. But if, if you are a teacher or whatever the job is that's not making a lot of money, um, then, uh, then we ought to, then I think we should agree to cap your, your monthly repayments, uh, at a, a, a manageable percentage of, of your income. So that's, that's what I would do. And Biden administration is talking about a bunch of options right now. All right. Well, thank you both so much. Let's go ahead and move right along here to Mark's question. We have Mark in Flemington. Go ahead, Mark. You're live on the line with us. Hi, uh, Congressman Tom. Mark and from Flemington, thanks for t taking my question. Thanks for all that you're doing, first and foremost. And I also want to shout out your interns and staff that take our calls day in and day out. Some people are very happy to have the conversation, some a little bit angry, and they take a I take a burn of the front line for you, so I want to give them a shout out first and foremost. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate much. the update. I appreciate the update on the gun control, but really, this country, there is no need for automatic weapons. Let's be real. I don't think our forefathers were thinking that automatic weapons was something that we were going to need to defend our home with. So I want to hear more about that. And just a comment to the earlier woman's point on gas prices. Part of the, the challenge, too, is the refinery capacity in the United States. We're off at least a million barrels from our high in 2020 of refining these products. So I feel like what you're doing with the refiners is exactly what we need to do. We need refinery capacity running in overdrive to help bring the prices down. They have the oil. We need more of it, obviously, but refinery is a big deal there. So let me know what you think on the gun. That's part of health and safety in this country, and I'm really concerned that we don't need, you know, as much ammunition and as much, well, we certainly don't need automatic weapons. Uh, and, you know, great first pass of the gun control bill. We need a second pass, and we need these weapons removed from the streets. Thank you so much. And, and yeah, so the, the re, on the refiners, that is the big bottleneck right now. And they, they took huge capacity offline in 2020 because we weren't purchasing as much gas 
uh, and they did not, for whatever reason, uh, act quickly enough to uh, rebuild that capacity, even when it was very clear that the economy was coming back and people were uh, going to be driving and flying uh, again. So we are going to look, well, we are looking very hard at that. And, and as I said, I, I urged the president to use all the powers that he has uh, to compel action if we don't get what we need from uh, the industry. On guns, I, I, I should have said this up front, like I'm happy that we got or that we seem to be close to a compromise deal. I'm always willing to take a bipartisan agreement that makes things better in America, even if it's not perfect. But we do need to do a lot more than is possible right now in the divided Senate that uh, that we have. Uh, I completely agree with you uh, about uh, uh, assault rifles with high-capacity magazines, uh, weapons that are designed for the battlefield that, that fire rounds um, uh, uh, not only at a much faster rate, um, but at a much higher speed than uh, an ordinary handgun or hunting rifle uh, that 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 just are designed to, to kill and produce carnage. Uh, ask any emergency room physician the difference between a wound caused by a handgun uh, and a wound caused by an AR-15, uh, and and you'll know what I what I mean. Um, so yes, I have always supported um, going back to the assault rifles ban that was put in place in 1994. Uh, I would remind uh, folks that back then, uh, former President Ronald Reagan was the main champion uh, of that assault rifles ban. Um, this was bipartisan. Once upon a time in America, things have gotten much more polarized, uh, but it's no less important uh, if you agree with me that protecting the lives of our children um, and making life easier for uh, our law enforcement officers should be a high priority uh, for uh, for Congress. I'm also interested, by the way, um, in looking at the marketing of these weapons in uh, in America. Uh, it, it should not be the case that uh, gun manufacturers are allowed to market these weapons to children. There are no restrictions on that right now. We have restrictions on marketing cigarettes and alcohol to children, but not uh, these weapons of uh, of, of war. Um, these uh, we have gun manufacturers that are sponsoring uh, shoot 'em up video games. Um, a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, vid video games are the problem." Uh, well, <laughs> if video games are are a problem, why why are we allowing manufacturers of AR-15s to to sponsor uh, uh, shoot 'em up video games and to advertise uh, to children within them? Um, there are uh, gun ads out there that uh, that that basically uh, create um, the 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 impression among people that the purpose of owning a gun is to fight the government. Well, the government is the police, and you can't be for law enforcement in this country if you're promoting a culture of people arming themselves against the government. That's what led to January 6th. That it is what it is what leads to a lot of the violence that our law enforcement officers face every single day uh, on uh, on their jobs. So um, there's a lot more that we need to do, and I'm going to keep working on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming to our forum tonight. Let's go ahead and get Michael up next here. Michael's uh, listening in here from Warren. Michael, you're live on the line with us. Go ahead with your question for the congressman. Hey, thanks so much. I honestly, until now, until a year ago or so, I never thought I'd care about politics, um, but with so much going on, so many negative things going on with a full Democratic control in Washington, D.C., I, I have to ask, uh, with eyes wide open of everything that's gone on in the past year, can you honestly say, will you endorse Joe Biden for president in 2024? Can you do that tonight, Congressman? Uh, I don't even know if he's running in 2024 or who's running. So I'm not going to opine on, uh, on who should be president. I think, look, I think he, he inherited a, uh, an incredibly difficult situation in, in our country. We just went through probably the biggest economic dislocation in the last several decades. Um, 
Again, we have tens of millions of people unemployed. Uh, we had a disease that claimed the lives of more Americans uh, than we lost in World War I, World War II, and all the wars of the century combined. Um, we have global turmoil, uh, including a war in Ukraine um, that is uh, probably the biggest threat to global stability that we've seen, uh, not to mention the global economy that we've seen uh, since uh, the end of the, the Cold War. Um, I haven't agreed with everything that Biden did. I was a strong critic of uh, what he did in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, I think he's handled the war in Ukraine, in contrast, magnificently. Uh, and I think he's doing the best he can with a very, very um, uh, uh, weak hand uh, in dealing with, uh, uh, with the inflation uh, that we're now facing. I'm open to anybody out there who has better uh, policies, better suggestions. Um, but I, I have very little patience for people who, uh, who criticize this or any president without saying exactly what they would do differently, backed by facts. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm, what I would do. I'll tell you where I agree with him. I'll tell you where I disagree with him. I'll tell you what I'm urging him to do, what I'm trying to do uh, in the Congress. And I hope that you hold every, everyone else in our political debate to the same standard. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. And actually, before I let Michael go here, Congressman, he did submit another question, and he's asking, will Congress pass a bill to protect Roe v. Wade? Um, Congress, uh, the House of Representatives has passed a bill to enshrine Roe v. Wade, uh, which I strongly supported and co-sponsored. Um, we would need 60 votes in the Senate because of the filibuster to enact that into law, and right now we do not have 60 votes. Uh, we've got all the Democrats willing to support that. We've got uh, a much smaller number of uh, Republicans. It does not add up to 60, uh, and this is important. We have in the state of New Jersey a uh, law that does protect Roe v. Wade for um, uh, for women, for doctors in our state. But, um, you know, number one, we're Americans. And I, I think all of us uh, have people who we know and love uh, who live in one of these states where abortion is about to be criminalized. I'm also worried that if we have a different Congress uh, in the next few years, we could see the opposite. We could see Congress actually impose a nationwide ban on abortion, as some of my colleagues in the Congress have promised uh, to do. And if they succeed, that would override New Jersey's law. And so this is a, this is a big issue. You know, a lot of us, uh, I, I get why, why people, uh, you know, may not care about politics, but politics cares about you. And this is an example of an issue that we kind of thought was settled. Uh, a lot of people took it for granted. And it turns out, um, you know, it wasn't settled. A lot of people got elected over the last uh, couple of decades who said that they would appoint judges who would overturn Roe v. Wade, and they did exactly what they said they would do. And we got to take that seriously uh, and make sure that uh, our preferences are registered uh, every single year we have an election. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that information, Congressman, and thank you, Michael. Let's go ahead and get our next question up here. And before I read this next question from Sharon in Millington, I want to give a last reminder here. I just want to encourage folks who haven't done so already to press 7 to provide an operator with your email address to receive updates moving forward from the Congressman's office. So again, this is one of the best ways to stay current, and I can see some of your neighbors are currently taking advantage of this option. So go ahead and press 7 right now if you haven't done so already to sign up. Another way to sign up tonight is by visiting malinowski.house.gov slash contact slash newsletter dash subscribe. So a couple of ways you can sign up here tonight. Go ahead and take advantage. So with that, we have Sharon's question next. She's asked, uh, asked me to read her question, Congressman. She says, given what we are seeing from the January 6th hearing and the new Mexico Board of Election, what are you doing to protect our votes for the next election cycle? Uh, I, I, hope, I hope folks have been following 
the January 6th hearing, not just because what happened on that day was such a dark day for America, but because it's not just past, it's present. Um, what happened on January 6th, it's increasingly clear, was an attempt, an organized attempt, backed, unfortunately, by the former president of the United States to overturn a democratic election, to stop the peaceful transfer of power from one president to another, something that's never happened in the history of our country, even though we've had so many crises and conflicts in the past. We, we have always managed to preserve and protect the sacred democratic traditions. And it was done with violence violence that was meted out to police officers who bravely defended the Capitol, violence that was directed, as we've seen from these hearings, at the, pre at the Vice President of the United States, Vice President Pence, who was determined to do his duty, to do the right thing. And on the day of the riot, he, he came, we learned today, within 40 feet of being um, assaulted by a mob that was chanting uh, a, a desire to kill him. The problem is not just, again, what happened then, but that many of these same people who backed what happened on January 6th are actively working in states across the country to try to do by legislative fiat what the riders on that day tried to do with baseball bats. So they're trying to install election officials who will who, number one, believe in the big lie about the election, number two, have said that in 2024, they would be willing to install electors to the Electoral College who ignore the will of the people and simply choose the next president on their own. I'm not sure if that's something we could survive as, as a democracy. Um, and so we've got to do everything we can to prevent it. The hearings, I think, are very helpful because they lay this out in, in such stark terms for, for the American people. Um, I, I hope the Justice Department will take the evidence that is being uncovered by Congress as far as it goes, and make sure that those who, who tried to overturn the election, I believe unlawfully, are held accountable. Um, and finally, I hope that we come out of these hearings with a bipartisan willingness to consider legislation to stop the next election from being subverted in this way. We, we may not agree on voting rights. We, we may not agree on, on voting by mail and drop boxes and, 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 you know, all the details of how elections are organized in the different states. We ought to at least be able to agree that the American people should choose the next president, not politicians in these states. And um, so that will be, I think, our number one priority when these hearings are done. Thanks so much for the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Sharon. Let's go ahead and move right along to Paul in Phillipsburg. Paul, you're live on the line with us. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I was very concerned about the uh, vote for the protection of our justices, both liberal as well as conservative. I'm an independent, so it is what it is. Everybody, in my personal opinion, should be afforded the protection. And I don't know why Tom voted against it. I'm just beside myself. I, I have no idea. I, I cannot fathom why you would vote against protecting our justices. I just... Again, that, that was my concern. Uh, well, I'm happy that you asked so that I can tell you exactly why. Um, so, number one, I absolutely want to protect our Supreme Court justices and their families. And I, I, I was incredibly disturbed by the, the, the threats uh, that Justice Kavanaugh received. I was one of the only Democrats, actually, who publicly condemned the protesters who are protesting outside his house, even though they are being peaceful. I don't think anybody should be protesting outside uh, a judge's uh, personal private home, threatening their families in that way. Um, the reason I voted no is because of something that happened in New Jersey 
a couple of years ago, and you may remember this. We had a district court judge named just, uh, Judge Esther Salas, um, uh, so a federal district court judge. And two years ago, a man showed up at her front door, her home. Um, her son opened the door, and the man opened fire and killed her son. Uh, he fired again and wounded uh, her husband. He was trying to kill her, the judge. Um, and fortunately, she was not there. She was she was unharmed. Um, we have been trying for the last two years to pass a simple piece of legislation that would provide greater protection to our federal judges at the district and appellate court level. So not just the Supreme Court, but our other federal court judges. And that legislation has been blocked in the Senate, um, really by, by one guy, by Senator Rand Paul, who for some reason does not want to do this. So again, we tried to get it into this bill to protect the Supreme Court judges. The Senate refused. And so as a protest, um, I, along with a lot of members of the New Jersey congressional delegation, decided to vote no on this bill to call attention the failure of Congress to protect our federal judges more broadly. Um, and I'm glad to say we got a lot of attention uh, to that problem. Um, a lot of articles have been written in the last couple of days uh, about the need to go well beyond this legislation to protect our Supreme Court judges. Um, and next week, uh, Senator Menendez is going to move again to bring up the broader legislation to protect our, our, uh, our, our, our other federal judges. So, in some, totally support the provisions of the Supreme Court. I just did not think they go far enough in protecting our federal judiciary. Um, and along with my colleagues, we wanted to make a statement about that, it's about protecting our judges in New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and get this next question in here from Peter in Berkeley Heights. Peter? Welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question. Um, hi, Congressman. Um, I hey, Peter. Start out, uh, I, 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 I really liked uh, a lot of the um, economic uh, prescriptions that you were uh, talking about uh, earlier. Um, uh, but I did want to ask, um, uh, do you have any um, thoughts or plans uh, uh, moving forward? to help make uh, health care uh, more accessible uh, to people, uh, especially lower uh, income people or people who may be kind of like lower but not quite low enough to get uh, a substantial enough assistance to make it really a feasible option? Um, absolutely. So uh, let, me, let me talk about two uh, examples. Number one, something we actually – succeeded in doing, uh, protecting the Affordable Care Act uh, at a time when it was one vote away from being repealed in the U.S. Senate, if you remember that. Uh, and then after I was elected, we, we passed legislation uh, precisely to make afford uh, health insurance under the ACA more affordable for middle-class folks who did not qualify for the extremely low-income subsidies that, that, uh, that were in place uh, from the beginning of the law. Um, so these new subsidies uh, have made, saved the, the average family um, uh, receiving the affordable, uh, their health care under the Affordable Care Act by up to hundreds of dollars a month in the state of New Jersey. Um, and anybody can go on uh, our uh, uh, New Jersey uh, Health Insurance Exchange uh, website um, to see if they qualify for those uh, subsidies. So uh, if, if, if this is something that affects you personally, I would very much encourage you to do that. Now, that law, and this is really important for folks to know, um, that law that, that, that made the ACA much more affordable for middle-class Americans uh, expires close to the end of this year. So Congress is going to have to renew it. And uh, I am really, really focused right now on trying to make sure that uh, that we do that. So we may have another political debate in September, October of, uh, of this year on whether that savings is going to continue, and I'm going to fight to make sure that it does. 
Second thing that I want to do that we've not done yet is make prescription drugs more affordable uh, to Americans, particularly to our seniors. You know we pay more for drugs in America than uh, people do in, in any other country in, uh, in the world. Um, and I think one simple solution that, by the way, the vast majority of Americans uh, agree with, uh, that even President Trump campaigned on in 2016, would be to allow Medicare finally to be able to negotiate with the drug companies to get the cost of prescription drugs down. Um, we tried to pass that. We did pass that in the House um, uh, last year. Um, we are going to make another run of it uh, in the Senate this year under the budget reconciliation rule that allows us to uh, not have to get the 60 votes to break the filibuster. Um, that would save uh, Americans a heck of a lot of money, especially at a time when we're facing inflation. I think that would be a good idea. And by the way, as part of that uh, that reform, we would cap out-of-pocket expenses under Medicare for, for drugs at $2,000 a year and cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There are folks paying $1,000 a month for insulin in America, a drug that was invented over 100 years ago. Uh, with a patent sold for one dollar, so makes no sense. That's something I really want to um, try to get done by the end of this year. Thanks so much. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks so much, Congressman and Peter. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and uh, read this next question from Dwayne in Union City. He's asking, "What do you think our role should be in the Ukrainian war? Also, what do you think the outcome of this situation will be?" I think what's happening in Ukraine, it's not just a human tragedy. It's, it's important to the safety and security of the United States and the whole world. What, what Putin is trying to do in Ukraine is to tear to shreds the rules that have kept the peace for the most part between the big powers in the world ever since the Second World War. Um, he's trying to tear up the rule that says you can't change borders by force. You can't change borders with tanks. And the Ukrainian people have decided with incredible courage to stand up to that. And I think we need to stand with them. I've never been for sending our troops to Ukraine. I don't want the United States to get involved in this war directly. But I do believe that we should be giving the, uh, the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military whatever they need to be able to defend their country and ultimately win this fight. I've also supported the very strong economic sanctions that we've imposed on Russia. Um, and uh, a few weeks ago, I got a bill passed in the House of Representatives that would enable uh, the Biden administration to take some of these Russian oligarchs' assets that have been frozen, like the, the fancy yachts that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and villas and private planes uh, and to actually seize those properties so that we can use the proceeds to help the people of Ukraine rebuild after this uh, this war. How, how do I think it's going to end? Uh, I don't think Putin's going to win. Uh, he uh, His plan was to topple the government of Ukraine, uh, to get rid of Zelensky, to basically erase that country from the map, uh, and he lost that battle. He's now trying to save a little bit of face by killing a lot more Ukrainians to take uh, a portion of the eastern part of the country. And again, the Ukrainians are bravely holding their ground. Uh, I think um, that over the next few weeks, this is my hope, as we get more of the heavy weapons, particularly artillery, to the Ukrainians, um, there will come a point where Putin and the Russians understand that they can't advance any further, that in fact they're in danger of losing uh, the, the, the portion of Ukraine that they've occupied in the east. And at that point, there will be a, a greater opportunity to negotiate a ceasefire. Um, I still think the sanctions on Russia will continue well beyond that. Um, it is important at the end of the day that Putin pay a terrible price for what he's done because I want China, I want every other dictatorship that may think of doing this in the future to think twice 
And, and so I'm glad that we stood up strong, even though we paid a price as well in the form of higher gas prices. I, I do think uh, this is a test that we need to show the world that we can pass. Thank you very much. All right. Let's take this next question here from Alana in Lebanon. Alana, you're live on the line with us. Go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Congressman. Um, my understanding is you have not come out uh, against the Saudis and their war in Yemen. And if that's so, I'd like to know why you have not come out against the Saudis. Oh, I have, actually. And I've sponsored legislation, not just come out against it, but I have sponsored lead legislation uh, in the House of Representatives that we passed to um, prevent U.S. arms that we sell to the Saudis from being used. Uh, in Yemen, we got some of that done. There's still more that I'm trying to uh, to do. Uh, I've probably been the biggest critic of Saudi Arabia in uh, in the Congress the last couple of years from um, trying to hold them accountable for the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist uh, who was so brutally uh, killed by uh, Saudi Arabia's crown prince, uh, to getting us uh, uh, disentangled from the war in Yemen. And as I stressed before, pushing the Saudis to do the one thing that they're supposed to be doing to benefit the world, and that's trying to keep energy markets uh, more stable. Uh, we do need them to be on our side right now in this fight uh, over Ukraine. And the best way they can do that is to try to replace some of the Russian oil that has been taken off the market. And I'm, uh, I think we need to be much tougher on them for, uh, for that as well. Um, very quickly, there has been some good news from Yemen. There's a ceasefire that seems to be holding. Um, the administration uh, has been pushing very hard diplomatically for that, and I'll keep holding their feet to the fire, but I'm, um, I'm optimistic, uh, maybe more optimistic now than, uh, than before, that we may actually be able to bring that war to an end. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Alana. Let's go ahead and get this next question in from Kevin in Warren. Kevin, want to welcome you to the call here tonight. Go ahead. Thank you, Congressman, for your intelligent and articulate leadership. We need that these days. Um, I feel strongly that um, our democracy is on the ballot this November. And I want to know whether you agree with that statement. And if you do, when will you start a daily drumbeat of that message? I, I do agree with that, um, and I feel like I've been talking about it ever since I got elected. It's one of the reasons that I ran for Congress in the first place, to try to make sure that we do protect our democracy. Look, I feel very strongly that um, I'm a believer in compromise. I'm a believer in bipartisanship. I'm a believer in um, uh, incremental progress sometimes. Uh, and uh, and, and I feel like I can lose a debate on a policy issue. I can lose a debate on what the corporate tax rate should be and how we should regulate fossil fuels and um, how much money we should be spending on infrastructure and not lose my country. But if we lose free and fair elections and the peaceful transfer of power from one president to another in this country, then we really have lost our country. We've lost the magic that has made America better and stronger than any other country in the world these last 200 years. And so while I'm willing to compromise on almost everything else, I'm not willing to compromise on protecting the rule of law, protecting our democracy, protecting our elections. And um, we've, got, we've got people, as I mentioned, who to this day are trying to do in states like Arizona and Georgia and Wisconsin, uh, others across the country, they're trying to do by legislative fiat what the rioters on January 6th tried to do with baseball bats. But they're trying to make it so that in the next presidential election, the states can do what former President Trump asked them to do on January 6th, and that's not to recognize the actual results of the election in those states. Um, so we got to be awake to this, and I hope, you know, without making this partisan, because uh, I see lots of Republicans like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, uh, who may disagree with me on policy but agree 100% on this, standing strong, um, let's vote for people 
who will protect um, the democratic foundations of this country, who will protect the Constitution, who will make sure that we always remain a country that settles our disputes by voting and not by violence. Thanks. Thanks so much, Congressman. And let's go ahead and take this next question from Scott in Bernardsville. Scott, you're live with us. Welcome to the call. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks. <clears throat> and thanks, Congressman. Uh, appreciate you getting on this on this call. I just had some more questions about, actually one question about the oil uh, situation and the gas situation, how expensive it is and how it's really crushing the 99 percenters out there. I mean, the one percenters, I see them at gas stations in my town paying $7 a gallon. They yeah. don't seem to care. But, but it's really crushing the rest. And I wonder what Congress can do to uh, push the president to, 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 to do something about it, or at least to change his messaging. I mean, he ran on the concept that, that there would be no ability for the oil industry to drill, period. He said he pledged to put the country on an irreversible path toward doing away with fossil fuel. Um, he said that, uh, you know, in a, in a debate, he said that, uh, in an answer to a question, but kiddo, I want you to just take a look, okay? You don't have to agree, but I want you to look in my eye. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we are going to end fossil fuel and I am not going to cooperate with them, okay? So what can Congress do to change this mindset? If I own an oil rig and I'm hearing this from the president, how can Congress give the oil refineries the economic incentive? They are disincentivized to do anything to update the technology, to increase their production. Why would they do that? Because it takes a long time to do that stuff. And if the, he's going to end it during his term, which is two years to go, why would they invest in anything? It doesn't make sense. Can Congress mindset, at least in the near term? Because this is from a guy who has an order in for an electric vehicle, American-made electric vehicle. Because, so I get it. But the grid isn't ready for this stuff yet. So what can we do to find a balance? Yeah. So I, I, agree, I agree with you there has to be a balance. Uh, we can't get off fossil fuels um, as quickly as we might want to in an ideal world. And here I am, and I'm a big champion of, of clean energy. I want America to be the clean energy superpower in the world, not China. I do want us to move as quickly as we can to wind and solar and other forms of clean energy. It would be fantastic for our economy, by the way, because we can win that race. And simultaneously, I am beating up the oil companies to produce more oil. And I can understand why, from their point of view, they they see a little bit of a contradiction there. Um, nobody in their right mind, including the president, whatever, however you may interpret his campaign statements, is saying that we, we end oil in the next two years. The, the administration's goal is that we generate 100% of our electricity by clean energy by 2050, which is almost 30 years away, not two years away. We're trying to send a signal to the industry that they need to begin that transition right now. And yet at the same time, that's not going to help anybody in the next month uh, struggle with these gas bills. We do need them to do more of what they do today. And I can tell you, and I know there's tons of angry stuff out there about this, but I can tell you there's nothing the Biden administration has done. There's no regulation they put into place. There's no rule or order that is preventing the oil companies from drilling and refining as much oil and gas today as they were before the pandemic. In fact, as I mentioned before, we are under Biden already producing more oil on average um, than we were on average during the four years of the Trump administration. The problem is the refinery capacity, which went way down and they were way too slow to start up. And, and I think like the balance is 
that we tell them, you know, you do have to do this. Um, it, it, and, and by the way, if you don't and, and gas prices stay this high, people are going to buy electric cars even faster, which Chevron and ExxonMobil uh, shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't want. Um, so, so do something now. Um, you'll still be making historic profits to try to get the price of gas down. And then over the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to help you make the transition to becoming clean energy companies. The big oil giants can afford to do this. Exxon and Chevron, they're so big and so wealthy, and they would tell you the same thing privately. They can afford to make the investments to make that transition over the next 30 years. And, and if they don't, look, consumers are going to be buying electric cars anyway, um, and they're going to go out of business if, if they don't. So it's a delicate balance, but it's one that we have to strike without going to the extreme in either direction. And I hope you would agree with that. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott. Really appreciate you joining the end of our forum here. That was our last question as we have reached our allotted time tonight. Congressman Malinowski you, did answer as many of your questions. Yeah, I go could ahead, take Congressman. one or two more. If you, if, you, if you can stay on for five more minutes with us, I can take one or two more. I want to make sure. Yeah, let us go ahead and queue up okay. another question here. Just give us a couple of seconds. And again, just want to thank everybody for staying on the line with us as well for this past 60 minutes. Really appreciate you joining the congressman here with us tonight. Again, just getting another caller queued up here real quick for you, congressman. I apologize for uh, the wait here. We do have a couple more we're sorting through right now, so we're getting them in line. So let me go ahead and welcome Claire in Short Hill. Claire, you're live on the line. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, this is Claire. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, the, my first question was one that I believe you have probably already answered, which is that um, we need to pass the CHIPS Act. The, the supply chain issues are huge, and we've got to get the CHIPS made here in the U.S., and, and I believe that's the, the act that you were talking about earlier. Yes, it is. Um, it is. It's part okay, of it. Okay, good. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's part of it. So um, the Senate has passed a version, the House has passed a version that I think is better and more ambitious because um, uh, it deals with more than just microchips. You know, we, we've got uh, other critical technologies that are in short supply, um, key ingredients for making solar panels, for example, battery technology. Uh, most of, well, actually virtually all of our antibiotic ingredients come from China right now. I don't like the sound of that. If we get into some kind of crisis with China and they control our entire supply of antibiotics. So there are a range of critical technologies that I think we need to be investing in bringing back to the United States. And New Jersey will benefit, by the way, disproportionately from that because we have a lot of advanced manufacturing especially in our part of, uh, of New Jersey. So I'm pushing for the more ambitious version. Uh, if we don't get the most ambitious version, we will take what we can get, because again, my philosophy is always get the best possible bill to the president. And since the Senate has already passed one version, I think we're in a strong position to say we're gonna get something done. Was All there, right, did thank you, have you another? so much. Yes, we actually do have another question. I'm just grabbing them right now to bring them live. Uh, let me just go ahead. We have Sasha from Phillipsburg. Sasha, you are live with us on the line. Go ahead. Hi, good evening, Congressman. How are you? Hey, Sasha. So I joined a bit late, and I do think I heard you mention something regarding the middle class. And my question is specifically regarding middle class. So I see that there's lots of programs for lower class people. And I'm, when I look for programs, I'm not seeing anything for the middle class. I'm a working mother of two, a single mother. I work 12-hour days, and I mean, apart from getting another job. I don't really see any programs um, for the, the middle class. I feel like the middle class is getting squeezed out. I see that um, lower class, they have 
different types of utility programs, utility assistance programs, um, and I don't see any of that. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, yeah, totally, uh, uh, totally agree with you. Um, you know, uh, middle class built America, and um, I think we, uh, we we have not done right by folks who uh, work hard, make a little bit more than uh, what qualifies you for uh, the the federal aid programs out there, but not enough to to be comfortable uh, in America, especially with the expenses that we face today. So a, a couple of things. One thing that we did successfully uh, in the last couple of years was to try to make the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, more affordable for middle class folks. The subsidies that made that real that made the health care really cheap under the Affordable Care Act ended uh, at fifty thousand dollars worth of income. Uh, and we know fifty thousand is not much in the state of New Jersey. So um, we passed a law that says no one is going to be paying more than around eight percent of their income uh, for health insurance. No matter how much you make, you won't pay more than eight percent of your income if you're getting your health insurance uh, through the exchanges on, on, uh, 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 under the Affordable Care Act. Um, I'd like to do the same thing for child care. I know you mentioned you had two kids. Not sure how old they are, but, um, but child care is incredibly expensive in New Jersey as it is across the country. If you've got two kids um, in child care in New Jersey, you're paying an average of twenty five, twenty six thousand $26,000. Uh, and for most middle class working families, that's just out of reach. Uh, and so I'd like to do basically the same concept, which is to cap those child care costs as a reasonable percentage of a person's income. So uh, that would apply to everybody at every, every income uh, level. Um, and then I also mentioned the prescription drug, um, uh, price problem and how we need to uh, put Medicare in a position with its huge bargaining power where they can negotiate down the price of prescription drugs directly with the drug companies. That would benefit not just Medicare recipients, but every everybody else um, who is burdened by the high cost of, uh, of prescription drugs. So those are just a, a few examples. Um, I think I also mentioned earlier in the call that we're going to be getting some property tax relief from the state. So if you're a homeowner uh, or a renter, uh, actually, you, you will be getting, uh, Governor Murphy announced a substantial property tax relief this year. And that is partly because the federal government, the Congress, during the pandemic, and this is what I fought for particularly hard, passed legislation to provide relief directly to our state and municipal governments. That allowed them to keep paying our cops and our firefighters and our teachers during the pandemic uh, without raising property taxes. And it turns out there was enough left over that we're going to be able to get a rebate this year. Uh, and that'll take some of the sting out of the inflation for folks in New Jersey. All right. Well, Tom, that was the last couple of questions that we had here. I want to just thank everyone who stayed on here for the after party. Uh, now, if your question wasn't answered tonight, uh, we do encourage you to stay on with us until the very end here. You can go ahead and leave us a voicemail message. So in leaving those voicemails, we do ask that you please leave us your name and your best contact information so that we do have a fighting chance of reaching back out to you. You may also grab some more information by visiting malinowski.house.gov, or you can give the Congressman's District Office a call, and that phone number is 908-547-3307. So we appreciate everybody's time here. So with that, Congressman, please bring us to the finish line, if you would. Well, thanks to everyone who stayed for the finish line, uh, uh, and thank you so much for the, uh, the really, really great questions. I think we... I'm sure we didn't cover everything, uh, and I know we didn't get to absolutely everyone, but I think we covered uh, the big issues today, and I, I will uh, promise to keep on doing these, both uh, live town halls, and we'll get information out um, through uh, our email list and on our social media so that you know when we're doing those, uh, 
Uh, and as often as we can, we'll be doing these telephone town halls as well. So whatever is most convenient for you, I want to hear from you. I want to be able to answer your questions directly. Thank you all so much, and have a have a wonderful evening, everyone. Look forward to the next time.